Hello everybody and welcome back to another Pitch Deck Review Live. This is our July issue and I am super excited to talk with you all about uh, the interesting things that have come up in today's Pitch Decks. Now, if you want to submit a Pitch Deck yourself, you absolutely can. The Pitch Deck Review Lives are available to everybody who has a Pitch Guide account. If you want to submit your own Pitch Deck, you can if you're a member. So every month I pick two of the submit a Dex and do a live teardown. That's what I do when I do a pitch coaching session with someone, except I tend to be a lot better prepared. I haven't looked at these decks an awful lot, but the cool thing about that is that you get to follow along with me as I build up a first impression of these companies as I'm looking at them. All right, so without further ado, let's take a look. We have two decks today. The first one is from a company called Peckish. Now, Let's have a look here. Yeah. So Peckish is doing something really interesting. The company says it is doing AI stock taking from video in seconds. Now, I actually think this is a particularly good cover slide. And basically the reason I say that is Peckish is British slang for being a little bit hungry. So you already set the stage for restaurants, food and all that kind of stuff. Now, AI stock taking, I can imagine in a heartbeat what that is. You take a video, you point an AI at it, and it does the counting of how many cans of beans you have or whatever, right? So I think as far as setting the stage for a story, this is actually a really good start, and I'm pretty psyched for the startup that it was able to do that. Now, off the bat, what I would add on this slide is a little bit of context about how much you're raising or what stage you're at. Like, if this is a company that's already got 5,000 customers and is doing, you know, a bunch of revenue, that's a very different story that we're about to listen to than somebody who has just got a first MVP of a product or just starting to look at the first kind of inklings of what it's trying to do. The company says that after payroll, restaurants spend more on inventory than anything, and they lose a quarter of it every week. A quarter of it? Oh, inventory. I'm guessing that's what they mean. Okay, so here, the problem could have been clearer by virtue of, it would have been nice if it was clear what the it referred to here. But I'm going to assume that they mean that the restaurant lose a quarter of the inventory, i.e. any sort of fresh foods and that kind of stuff that, that is no longer fresh has to be discarded somehow. And keeping track of that makes a lot of sense if that's hard, right? If you're in a restaurant and you have a mushroom dish on the menu, you got to know how many mushrooms you have. So, okay, that's an interesting one. So the company is saying that it's outlining the problem as 24% inventory loss in the grocery in the restaurant sector and that is much higher than grocery which makes sense tighter margins and 97% cite raising food costs as one of the leading causes of failure. Okay. I think this is a really compelling problem statement. What the company is doing here is really outlining not just what the problem is, so the amount of loss and that kind of thing, which is super crucial, but it's also highlighting the impact of the problem, which I think is really important because your investor won't necessarily know why a problem is a problem, right? You can explain something to them, but not everybody has the same context and background for why something is important. So being able to contextualize what the actual problem is and sharing with your potential audience, i.e. the investors, why this matters is super important. And so in this case, being able to say that tighter margins, yes, I believe that, and a huge amount of loss means if you can reduce that or track it faster, of course that has a positive impact. Okay, slide two. The problem, restaurant Tracking restaurant inventory is hard and getting it right costs too much time and resource. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. It's explaining that legacy systems don't really work, storage is a mess, and a lot of thing changes. Yeah. I think my favorite uh, story about this was at some point I went to a, a restaurant and it was a outdoor restaurant type situation. And they had a special offer on uh, bitters, like a, a type of British beer. And uh, I asked the waiter, like, why do you have bitter, of all things, on special offer? That seems random. And he was like, bitter doesn't stay good for very long. And we actually had a two-day motorbike, like a biker event here last weekend. And um, so we bought a bunch of bitters and lagers and that kind of thing, the things we thought bikers were buying. But it was a hot day and they all drank rosé. <laughs> And the waiter was laughing. It's like, we sold out of rosé because all these burly motorbike dudes were drinking rosé. And so now we had all this bitter that we needed to get rid of, and so we're selling it cheaper. 
And it's just a great example of how even when you've been in a restaurant industry for a while, you may not be able to fully dial in what is going to sell. So it's all guess guesswork. And the problem is, if you have a bestseller on your hand that's surprising, if you run out, you can't sell any more of it because you can't just randomly appear the ingredients. That takes a little bit of time. So I think it's a really good way of framing this challenge and to explain why the problem is a problem. Okay, we've experienced these pain points. So this is the problem slide. Sorry, this is the team slide. I just recognized that Harpreet is actually in the audience right now. Hello, Harpreet. Good to see you. And it's a really interesting way of outlining the why this is a good team, right? So he's saying, spent seven years of operations at Uber. Very helpful, right? It shows that he has uh, experience in scale. And Sebastian is a machine learning engineer, builds Uber's forecasting and fraud, fraud detection algorithms and is a computer vision expert. And then there's a whole list of people down the side of uh, people who've done additional things within these companies. Now, there is a thing at the top of this slide that says that the company has experienced pain points firsthand with their family-run restaurants. And nowhere here on the rest of the slide does it say anything about what these family-run restaurants are. Now, as a... As an investor, what I'm often looking for is founder market fit, right? What is it about these founders that makes them uniquely well positioned to run this particular company? Now, computer vision, operations, all these pieces of it are obviously really important parts of running this particular company. But I would also think that the restaurant industry in itself is pretty specialized. I actually had a pitch coaching client at one point who was in this space doing inventory control and especially around food and bed, so sorry, around alcohol. And they were focusing on, hey, actually a lot of alcohol goes missing. It's often theft and it's often the employees that do the stealing, which is a real problem, right? If there's one employee left at the end of the shift, it's easy to slip a bottle of wine into your bag or whatever. And that was a real problem for restaurants. And so they built a whole tool around that. Now, the cool thing about this company is that they clearly have the technical skills from Uber and Nokia and all these kinds of things. What I don't necessarily see is that is the link to what the specific food and beverage angle is. And I would have loved to see a little bit more about that here. The other thing I would have loved to see is links to their LinkedIn profiles, because if I'm going to be thinking about investing, I'm absolutely going to be looking at that. And that's a, a, a no-brainer. It's an obvious thing that people will be doing. But it's a good idea to keep that in mind. So I uh, make it as easy as for me as possible to take a look at that. Pickish removes uh, manual labor with instant stock group videos uh, uh, uploaded to WhatsApp, no app required. Okay, so that's an interesting one. So what this company is doing is that it's choosing to use WhatsApp as the means of uploading information. That's pretty cool in countries where WhatsApp is heavily used in the U.S., it's not as popular. Now, it's not a hardship to download WhatsApp. This is not really aimed at the consumers. This is aimed at the people work, working at the restaurants. So that's pretty cool. Now, I don't really know what's going on with this black and white bar situation here. I assume that this is meant to be some sort of a video, but obviously this is a PDF of the, of the uh, deck. And so I, I'm not seeing what's really happening here. But promising 18 hours of weekly savings and uh, $30,000 worth of increased revenue, those are excellent uh, selling points. And I, I don't know if that is real or true. I don't know if they're able to pull that off. But I think there's definitely something here that, sh that shows that there's a demand for this in the market. So that's super awesome. Next, or consumers say, wow, use it every day to get more accurate results than manual stock taking. Okay, really, that's all we have to say. It's, uh, it's, it shows how much of the uh, product is currently built, what all is uh, working about the product. And that's, I think, in this case, really all you have to say. Okay, these are the leading solutions in the market. So this is the competition slide. I think it's really good to have a very robust competition story as part of your pitch. No company operates in a vacuum, and it's helpful to be able to really nail down how you differentiate yourself. And so being able to show that there are competitors is good. I would have loved to see more about how this company is differentiated. This is... I think this is just screenshots of their homepages, which is great. And it shows what are the what are their go-to-market strap lines, right? One of them has restaurant inventory management make easy. Another one has keep uh, tabs on stocks, etc. So this helps position a little bit. But I don't immediately know what the differentiation is between Peckish and these brands. I would love to see a little bit more about that and to help understand why this company is going to beat 
these potential solutions. Okay. Oh, actually, we go into that. It's pretty unusual to have more than one competition slide, but it does happen. What the company does here is that it shows what the company does and then builds the slide into the solution. Too much manual work, we take it down to five minutes. Difficult to set up and learn, WhatsApp take care of it. Cost, less than a uh, cup of coffee a day. I think it's really uh, interesting and I think it really helps build out the, um, the story around how the company differentiates itself from the competition. Very clever. Really like it. Okay, so here it's uh, explaining what its pricing model is. Um, Eighty dollars, uh, eighty pounds or so uh, per month, I presume, or is that per year? It doesn't say. I think. Okay, price point per location. Uh, okay, so I don't know if this is per month or per year. That would be helpful to show off. Um, and then it shows off uh, the various ways that it uh, separates itself from its competition. Again. This is such a basic way of telling this part of the story, but it really helps. I think, again, like this, the competition slide is there to show off your competition, yes. But to an investor, it's, a, it's an opportunity for the founders to shine in terms of how they differentiate and stand out from the competition. It's not just we have competitors, it's not just we're better than the competition, but it's also about what is the thing you are doing that significantly differentiate yourself from other major players in the market? And is that differentiation good enough or interesting enough to turn this into a major company? Uh, I think that's the story the company is trying to go for here. And I, th I think it's actually doing a pretty good job here. Okay, we're growing with just a few point of sale partners today. They need us more than we need them. Okay, they partner with point of sales. Now, this is interesting. So this becomes, uh, it says GTM at the top right of the market, top right of the slide. But essentially, this is the go-to-market slide, right? By saying, hey, you are a point of sale provider. This is a, a product that we can offer that nobody else offers. This becomes a good extension or a potential upsell. Now, the great thing about that for an early stage startup is that means that you can tap into an existing market and an existing sales process, and it becomes a win. Now, it's a little bit risky, of course, because the people you partner with get to know a lot about your business. But I think for early stage startups, partnership uh, sales is a really powerful way to continue to grow. Mm. That's really all I have to say about this slide. It shows, A, that the company has thought about how it's going to do a go-to-market. B, that it has a go-to-market strategy that looks like it might work. And my next question would be, would be, how do you know that this is going to work? How far into this are you? And... Like, how is this, what is this looking like for you? Now, it's saying that it's converting 30% of all restaurant inbounds, which is great. It, it adds a little bit of context and numbers to how your go-to-market is going. All super important and powerful. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay, in five months, we built a pipeline of over 350,000 euros. So I'm a little confused. It seems like the company keeps flipping back and forth between uh, British pounds, presumably British pounds, and euros. And I've also seen dollars here somewhere, I think. So what are we talking about here? Why are we talking both do dollars, euros, and pounds? Now I don't really know where this company is based. And that's a little frustrating to me because as an investor, that is important, right? It's As an American investor, it's much easier to inve invest in a Delaware C-Corp than it is to invest in a British company or a Euro uh, European company or an Australian company. So I don't know where these guys are based. I think on the team slide, I saw New Zealand as one of the backgrounds. It might be worth just on your cover slide, say, headquartered London or something. It helps contextualize things. Or if you're raising money in dollars from U.S. investors, convert all the figures everywhere into U.S. dollars. It just helps bring a more uh, coherent story, which really helps uh, the investors understand. Now, <clears throat> seeing the, the traction in this case... Okay, so this is cheating a little bit, guys. ARR is only ever ARR. So potential ARR, I think it's what's going on here because I don't think the company currently has 352,000 euros worth of ARR. That's a really important amount of real revenue that's coming in. But seeing like the ARRs all the way down the chart makes me disappointed because at first glance, I thought this company was doing 350,000 euro worth of annual recurring revenue, which is a very different company than one that's doing 20 times less. Not a big deal, but I think just thinking about the psychology of the person who is looking at this and then converting, like, what is the message you're trying to convey? Um, 
if on this slide I think you're doing 350 and it turns out you're doing 12, I'm going to be disappointed, right? And disappointment, I'm not saying that investors make all their decisions with emotions, but we are humans. And that lingering feeling of disappointment will be there. So there's a better way of telling the story that doesn't make people go, oh, right? 12,000 is good at the stage you're at. So brag about that. And then maybe you can have the sites or the, the other numbers marked differently as like potential or whatever. A little bit more clarity there would be good. And got to, I've got to say, this isn't really a traction slide. The only thing that's traction here is converted to date. If it was a good traction slide, I would like to have seen a chart with number of sites and amount of ARR and whatever else. This is really a uh, sales funnel chart or a go-to-market chart or a sales chart or whatever. Not going to beat you up too hard about it because we got there in the end, but if I see a slide that says traction, I want to see traction. But I always think that slides, the headlines make a promise and then the slide has to fulfill the promise. And in that's ca this case, I see that the label traction I see 350,000 euros, and I think that's your traction. And that's not really what's going on here. So I, I get the temptation, but I think a little bit more intellectual honesty here would have been good. Okay, strong economics of 4.5 to 1. Okay, we're mixing up a couple of terms here, I think. So unit economics tends to be how a company delivers each unit of what it does and the cost of delivering those units. And so if you make, I don't know, cups, right? And the first cup you make costs $10,000 because it's a prototype. The 10,000th cup you make costs $50 because now you're operating at scale. And then at some point you start losing the economy of scale, right? The more you make, it can go from $50 to make down to $40 per, and then down to 39, then maybe 30, 38 and a half. But you get a point of diminishing returns. When I say unit economics, I tend to think about it that way. If you are building a SaaS company, there are certain fixed costs, i.e. some server costs and some whatever that, that are always running. No, it doesn't matter how many customers you have. But then on a SaaS business, you very quickly hit very good unit economics because each additional unit you sell doesn't really cost you anything. Now, I suspect what this company has done is that it's mixing up the lifetime value to customer acquisition cost, LTV to CAC arbitration, which is also important, that's also a ratio, but that is not your unit economics per se. That is your customer acquisition economics. Now, it's an easy mistake to make, but my worry here immediately is, oh, how good are these founders? Like, why are they mixing up these terms? Again, not a big deal. Totally not a big deal. And if I am super psyched about this company as an investor, I would tell you, hey, you're using the wrong terms here. Let's update that and then we're good to go thing. But it does set off a little bit of a, I need to inquire how experienced and how good these founders are, how experienced they are as operators of businesses. Now on the team slide, I saw that there were experienced operators in terms of technical operations, engineering operations. Now I'm curious, do they have startup backgrounds? Do they have, what is the other part of the business that isn't fully covered in the current team? Majority of the customer acquisition costs comes from referring fees paid to channel partners, referring to 90% of new customers. Yeah, that's great. And on the other side here, ARPC is 100 euros. I'm assuming that means avenue, average revenue per customer. That's not a super common acronym, but whatever, it's fine. Um, yeah, so it's a blended CAC 2 LTV arbitration graph. Totally fine. Very helpful to help understand what it costs you to acquire customers. Customer acquisition cost is less commonly used in business-to-business -business businesses because it's very hard to specifically point to where you spent the money to acquire a particular customer, right? For, B, for B2B sales, it's often a blended, blended marketing funnel. But it doesn't matter. I'm actually just nitpicking here. This slide is fine. I would just change it from unit, unit economics to customer acquisition economics, and you're good. And I'm not going to... Total addressable market of $5.3 billion. Oh, God. Okay, so I think that's a very high number. Tam, $9.75 billion, 15 million restaurants. Okay, so I don't know what that is. Are we saying, what does that Tam cover? Is it $10 billion per year of what? Because I think there's probably more than $10 million a year of sales in restaurants. 
Sam, total number of restaurants using cloud based. Okay, so your Sam is not going to be the total number of restaurants using cloud based systems. Because if Peckish massively executed and was like the best in this entire segment and took the entire market, like nobody did manual stock keeping again, I don't think this becomes a $5.2 billion business. I don't know how big it becomes, but I don't think it's $5.2 billion. And so I think we're tracking the wrong thing. And to really understand what we're tracking and what we should be tracking, this would take a conversation with the founders to really figure it out. Okay, what is the TAM? What's the SAM? How do you think about these things? What is your serviceable, obtainable market? Why is that $105 million? Now, if you're... Yeah, I, I, long story short, I think there is something missing with this slide. I think the founders got their terms a little bit mixed up. But that's fine. We can we can skip this for now. I'm just saying the the total addressable market is probably not five point three billion dollars, because that doesn't really make sense in this case. Okay, cool. EBITDA positive with it eighteen months with uh, machine learning. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is really interesting. It's showing where its revenues coming from, where its costs are coming in. This works for me. It shows the cost drivers. It shows the revenue drivers. Now, the important thing here is going to be, if you put on a slide, you're going to be EBITDA positive within 18 months. Everything in this pitch deck needs to show that you're A, raising enough money to get to that 18 months, right? But also that you are, that you have the receipts to show it. If you're promising me 18 months, let's go. Let's pick holes in what is not working. Let's figure out what is working. Let's figure out what are the pieces of the puzzle that need to be true for this to be EBITDA positive. I'm a little curious. That seems to be the goal for the company. In early stage companies, you want to get to break even. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with this slide. It's just, it's, it feels like these are metrics like EBITDA and pro profitability tend to be for slightly later stage companies. So now I'm a little bit confused how much revenue this company is already doing. And the previous slide said 12,000 12, ARR. What I'm worried about when I see this slide is that the company is trying to be too conservative and working too hard to get to a place where it can get to break even, which is great, but that kind of shouts that it's not trying to grow at venture speed. Now, if I'm going to make a venture investment, I want to see this company grow at a breakneck speed and really get there really fast. So this could just be the founders showing an abundance of caution and being a little bit extra careful. Or this could be potentially a red flag, that there's something up with how the company is thinking about its financials and how it's going to grow. And this would this slide inspires me to think about, hey, are you trying to exit too soon? Are you tr putting a cap on how far this company could grow because the startup founders are not ambitious enough? So this would be part of the conversation with the founders. But if I were an analyst looking at this deck, I would take a little note saying, hey, there's been a few things in this slide deck that make me think that these are very good technical founders, but they don't necessarily have the chops in terms of the business, which is fine. That's teachable, right? And I think if you're building a machine vision stock taking tool, the tech is clearly the hard part. But you also have to have a deep understanding of the business side of things. And yeah, I would do some grilling of this founding team to make sure that they have that covered very well. Okay, the company is saying it's building a proprietary data set with labeled images. Yeah, okay, so this is essentially the, the tech traction. Now, this works for me as a traction slide because it's explaining some of the hard problems it has solved with the technology. Now, it's saying it's labeled 200,000 images, which is impressive, right? That That is a few steps towards having a proprietary data set. And that's literally what the top of the slide says here. And so the more of that you can have, the better. However, you're up against some pretty, pretty hardcore, pretty well-trained data sets already. And so I would make a mental note here to say, hey, could I go and talk to a, mach a machine vision expert that I have in my back pocket and say, hey, could you just get an off-the-shelf machine vision library, could you use ChatGPT or one of the image vision libraries or whatever, sorry, OpenAI's libraries or Google has a really good uh, machine vision library. Uh, Microsoft does a fantastic machine vision library. Like, could I just grab something off the shelf? And how much of a head start is this 200,000 labeled images data set? 
If it turns out it's not really that much of an advantage, then the moat goes away. If it turns out this is actually a remarkably hard problem, which I suspect it is because it's pretty specialist, right? Yeah, I don't know how good, like, how to read this. I sh I, the way I read this is that the company has made tremendous progress in building this own data set. The next step for me would be to fully understand how good this data set is and how important it is to keep a lead, i.e., if a bigger competitor comes along, or if, say, one of the point-of-sale systems decides to want to buy this company, is it worth buying the company just for the data set and the engineers? If so, that adds massive uh, inherent value to this company. And so that's a good thing to look at when you're looking at a potential investment. Okay, we're first mover. Oh, no. Okay, first mover advantage is never a good thing. And the reason I say that is all the big, famous products we have in our pockets right now were not the first movers. Google was the 29th search engine. Apple did not invent the smartphone. Um, Facebook wasn't the first social network, right? First mover advantage is not nearly as much of a win as a lot of founders think it is. Especially if somebody like Microsoft wakes up and goes, oh, I can throw $20 million at making our own data set. Now, the, the bet you're making, in effect, is our data set uh, good enough if somebody decides to throw $200 million at something? Uh, unclear. Anyway, apart from my cringe <laughs> at the first mover thing, computer vision combined with deep learning, that's good. Quality of your product, yes. Just like invoice scanning, OKR stuff, innovation nobody thought possible. Envoice scanning has been around five years ago. I remember building some OKR stuff five years ago. But yeah, it's definitely a lot better than it is today. High probability of being a norm. Teams among the handful of computer vision experts in the world. Sure. I think none of these are super strong, but it definitely shows that we right time, right place, let's do this. I buy it. Uh, I would have loved to have this backed by maybe a patent or maybe something that is a little bit more hard um, oh, sorry, I was thinking this is a defensibility slide. This is, in fact, a why now slide. My apologies. This slide is great. Ignore what I just said. <laughs> Sometimes I read these things a little bit too quickly. Okay, we are raising... Okay, so now I'm a little confused because back a previous couple of slides ago... Let me see if I can find that. I thought the company was saying it was raising 300k. I can't find it now. And we're running low on time. So I'm not going to pick on them for that, but it's definitely worth... Okay, they're doing. They're raising six hundred sixty thousand euros to get to one million dollars of ARR in eighteen months. Okay, that's a totally fine raise. Call it seven hundred k because there's absolutely no point in having a weird number on there. Okay, so I would have loved to see. I see that this is the last slide. I would have loved to see an operating plan slide here because I would love to see what are the steps that the company is going to do to get to where it's going. It's saying it's 10xing its investment in image labeling for computer vision models. Yes. Accelerate growth where existing pipeline. Yes. And, okay, let's have a look. And are doing sales and marketing process to revenue milestones. I would have loved to see an operating plan slide. Just because I would have loved to see how do you plan to break this down? Like over the next 18 months, where are you spending the money? What are the major milestones? And all that sort of thing, right? I see that you have revenue milestones. That's great. Yeah, this is actually a pretty good asking use of fund slide. It could be better, but this is probably good enough to raise funding. Okay. I am realizing I've gone 35 minutes and I want to make sure that I have enough for the next company as well. But just the high level, what do I see when I look at this pitch deck uh, story? Uh, one, I'm a little worried about the business experience of these founders. There's a couple of little things in there that are less common in terms of terms, in terms of... Um, get, mistaking some of the business basics and all that kind of stuff. Again, no big deal. Happens all the time. And, like, experienced founders don't make these kinds of mistakes. And so what they're signaling is like, hey, we did as well as we could, because why wouldn't you on a pitch deck? And we made some pretty basic mistakes. Now, to me, there's nothing inherently wrong in that, right? That's not going to stop you from raising money. But as an investor, I am trying to figure out 
what level of founders am I working with here? How experienced are they? What are they good at? What are their weaknesses? Can we fill up the little gaps and, and challenges with the weaknesses? Like the number of investment meetings I've sat in where it's like super clear that the CTO is like an absolute no holds barred rock star. Yeah, I would put money behind this CTO every day of the week. But the person running the business, uh, not sure. Or the person doing the marketing, uh, not sure, right? And so for this one, I think what I'm seeing is that there's a pretty solid and experienced technical team. I would have loved to get a little bit more color on how the business side is going to run. Now, they didn't fall into some of the obvious trap that mediocre founders do. There is a pretty clear go-to-market. Using a um, partnerships model is great. Using um, Having pretty clear milestones for growth and revenue and all that kind of stuff, great. I would have loved to see a little bit more resolution, a little bit more, col more color, but it seems technically great, startup-wise or uh, founder-wise, not sure. Uh, and you can always hire somebody, right? Find a very sharp MBA who knows how to run the business side of startups or bring in somebody who's done a bunch of startups as a founder before, and then they take care of that, right? And you can focus on building the product. Now, this slide deck doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't say, hey, we're going to bring in some... <laughs> In, in investment land, they call it adult supervision, which is super rude and horrible. But you can say that as a founder. It's like, hey, we need a little bit of adult supervision on the business side. The rest we've got covered. Totally cool. Totally fine thing to say. I think this is a really interesting company. I think raising 660k euros should be pretty straightforward. And if you can partner with some of the... Like you're seeing some early traction in how you're going to do the sales... Like 1 million ARR at the end of 18 months is pretty aggressive, but I can see it. Like, I can see it. And so this is a, a, a very good slide deck. It's got some gaps, got some holes. I would feed it through the AI tool one more time. We actually launched a brand new version of the AI tool yesterday, which uses a brand new engine, has much more in-depth feedback, and it looks prettier too. So yeah, feed it through again, see, see what you come back with. And uh, yeah, I think you're really cruising in the right direction. Really well done. Okay, cool. Thank you, Peckish. So for the next slide deck, we have Windfalls. Now, gosh, AI image generation has come a long way. It's wild. So sorry, I'm just nerding out as a photographer here. I'm noticing that like her cheek and eye is in focus, but the hands are not. And then the sweater is also in focus. So somehow this AI generated image has actually figured out a focal plane where everything inside the focal plane is in focus and everything beyond or in front of it is not. That's really advanced and looks great. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> not the nerd out about photos here. Let's talk about Windfalls. Okay, Windfalls is a autonomous savings service, identifying and executing savings opportunities on an ongoing basis. Okay, so this is a fintech company. I'm assuming it's a B2C fintech company and yeah, autonomous saving service. I'm guessing it's some sort of a robo-investor type situation. Windfalls is a great name for this kind of company, so that's pretty cool. And yeah, I like the subtlety of having the plants in the background, so you have some like growth type mindset thoughts. Same feedback as for the last pitch deck. I wish there was a little bit more context for how far along they are. Is this a pre-seed round? Is this a seed round? Like, why am I looking at this deck kind of thing? Okay. Americans are overpaying for their subscriptions and services, res resulting in thousands of dollars of missed savings annually. Oh, actually, so this wasn't what I thought it was. So this is more of a subscription monitoring thing. Okay, there's a there's a, quite a few companies that are doing that already. So this is an interesting one. And now I immediately am curious about how it is going to offer those services. Okay, cool. Currently, there are two bad options, budgeting apps and human calling services, or do-it-yourself savings. So are we talking about savings or are we talking about canceling subscriptions? I thought this was like a robo-investor. Okay, so now I'm a little bit curious because I know there are products in both the robo-investment world and in the cancel your subscriptions that you don't use world competitive uh, landscape, but this slide seems to suggest that doesn't exist. So now... I'm a little bit confused both about how the company is positioning itself and how it sees itself in the market. Okay, saving is more needed than ever and is increasingly possible. AI enabling automation, bill negotiation, okay, 
Okay, yeah. So this is the solution slide explaining why savings is needed and why what the company is doing to make this possible. Saving is truly autonomous. Set it, forget it, save again, save some more. Okay. Uh, savings opportunities. Okay, so I don't really know how this works, but... Yes, because I'm not entirely sure. It's like, how do you save $60 a month on your Spectrum bill? What does it mean to have a $15 one-off on your AT&T bill? I don't, I'm confused by the mechanism that this company is doing to make these savings happen. Okay, how do we do it? Okay, now we get to it. Our AI execution engine, an opportunity database from the backbone of the service. Okay, so basically, as far as I can tell now, this company monitors your bank account sees who you're giving money to. So for example, you pay AT&T so and so much money every month. And then it has a database of potential uh, deals, price points, promotions, offers, and that kind of thing. And if it realizes you're paying $90 a month for something that should be cost costing $70 a month, it negotiated on your behalf, maybe? Unclear. But I like the idea. That's, that seems helpful. What I hope is that the company has the business model associated with the amount of money it saves. So it actually can get a percentage of that. But let's find out. Okay, we help save across multiple service areas and verticals. Internet, cell phone, cable, security, and media. Negotiate your bills like internet. So I am confused. Maybe I am naive here, but I didn't realize you could actually negotiate bills. Like when you get a bill, you pay it, right? And if you're not happy, you change providers. But maybe that's not how it works. I feel like I'm missing a step here. There's something about windfalls that clearly isn't connecting with me, and I don't understand what the deal is or who this is for. But I think that says something about the storytelling. It is worth thinking about, is your target audience, i.e. investors, the kind of people who would use these products? Now, investors get paid a lot of money, and the way I've read this so far is, oh, save $10 here, save $20 there. Yes, a lot of people look after the pennies, but a lot of people also don't care. And I've talked before on this, on these pitch deck reviews, that often there's a little bit of an empathy gap between investors who tend to be paid a lot of money and startups that are trying to help people who don't have a lot of money. I feel like there's something missing from this story to really hook me in, to, to explain, okay, what is the need behind this? And what is the narrative behind that need? And so really trying to figure that out with the founders and saying, okay, like, who's this for? What is the use case? And that kind of thing. And that could be pretty easily done. If you start to pitch with, hey, this is Linda. Linda is a mother of two. She has this job. Inflation is going up faster than her pay raises are. And so she is very motivated to save some money. These are regular expenses. This is what we can do. Something like that. Like, I, I feel like, like because savings, i.e. putting money away, and saving, i.e. spending less, are basically synonymous, I think I got off on the wrong foot with windfalls right from slide one. And maybe that's me. Maybe I'm being stupid and, and not fully getting it. But there's a risk that other people also fall into that gap. And good storytelling doesn't leave a lot of room for misunderstandings like that. So tidying up the story a little bit more, I sense would have been helpful for me at least. Okay, we'll help you refine, refinance and find cheaper rates. We can negotiate your bills, continuous market research, scan for cheap alternatives. We'll help you get payment plans, financial assistance, etc. Okay, yep, that all makes sense. Bill negotiation alone is a significant opportunity. Again, as I just mentioned, I wasn't aware that bill negotiation was actually a thing at all. And so being told that it's a significant opportunity makes me both expand and contract. I contract because I'm like, is this really a thing? Right? But I also expand. If this is a thing I didn't know about, maybe this is actually a really big and interesting opportunity here. Now, I think... The TAM here, the total addressable market, there is no way that is $67 billion, i.e. if windfalls is extremely successful, it cannot become. So if it is extremely successful and replaces all the other businesses that windfall could replace, is it going to become a $67 billion business? I don't think so, because I think in this $67 billion, you include internet, cell phone, cable and security, etc. Now, 
Windfalls is not an internet company. It's not a cable and security company. It's not a cell phone company, right? And so I think the founders here conflated what these different numbers are. The SAM is 60%, and then the SOM is, assume we capture 10% of SAM in the first few years. Now, the serviceable, obtainable market should represent the amount of money Windfalls can take if it takes the percentage of the market it can do. I think what has happened here is that windfalls is confusing revenue, which is what your sum ultimately should be, with gross market value. And that's a red flag, right? I, I think if windfalls executes perfectly, and it says it can be a $4 billion market, $4 billion company, i.e. it has $4 billion worth of revenue in the first few years, like that is, in, that is incredible. If you can build a $4 billion company in a few years, you are an inc incredible founder. But I don't think what the, that's what this slide is actually saying. So maybe once we click to the next one and we see the financial projections, maybe I'm wrong. But my suspicion is here that the company hasn't quite understa understood how market sizing works. And therefore, yeah, that sets off some red flags around the quality of the founders and that kind of thing. But... So to, just to reiterate on this, if this company charges its customers $5 a month, so let's just do the math, $5 per month times 12, that's $60 a year. Now to get this 4 billion, it would have to have 66.6 6 million customers. Now, do I believe that Windfalls is going to get 6.6 6 million customers in the next few years? I don't know. I don't know. That feels like a stretch. But maybe that's what's about to happen and I'm, I've completely misjudged this company. Okay, cool. Let's take a look. That's just a start. With access to rich customer email and transaction data, the opportunities are endless. Lifestyle. Yeah, okay. So this becomes a, we can offer you deals based on your spend and customized shopping, targeted advertising. We know you really well, therefore we can serve you a really tight business model. That makes sense. Nexus of insight and actions. Insight actions. Okay, yeah. This is a really interesting way of doing... I like that. I like that. This is a great way of positioning yourself against the competitors and showing what you can do. Huh, this is good. Okay, we require minimal customer input and focus on repetitive and automated savings. Yeah. Okay, this is great. The explaining how you differentiate yourself in the market. This is all very cool into it. Okay, we're perfecting AI voice negotiation. Okay, so basically what I'm now getting is that this company is basically calling Spectrum or whatever phone provider on behalf of the customer and tries to do some sort of negotiation over customer service so you don't have to. Cool. Proof of value, growth, scale. Okay, so it's saying it's doing advertising. Wait, what? Oh, these are the go-to-market channels. Got it. Here it's saying that it's doing paid advertising, referral programs, social media marketing for the first thousand customers, then influencer partnerships, B2B2C partnerships, content marketing for the next hundred thousand, and then beyond that, partnership expansions, PR, and media. It's free unless it generates value for the customer. Okay, so it seems like the business model is indeed a, the more we save, the more you pay kind of thing, which is cool. Yeah, this is a good business model. The go-to-market is not really believable because we haven't said anything about what the customer acquisition cost is yet. So figuring out that part, like how do you do, like it's all good and well to say paid ads and referral programs, but I want to know how much do they cost? Like what are your business metrics there? For growth, influencer partnerships, yeah, but how much are you planning to pay and all that kind of stuff? I know it says coming soon, so I haven't really thought it through yet, but... This is a very undercooked go-to-market strategy, which is worrying for a company that's a direct-to-consumer company, essentially. Okay, value proposition. Effortless savings automated. I like that. High LTV. Yes, but how high? What are the numbers you're aiming for? Revenue model. We charge 40% of savings. Okay. Okay. 40% of savings is really good win. It means that the customer saves 60% of what, what gets saved, and you get 40% of it. 
collect over time and structure. So I'm curious how you would collect that. So if I, I feel like the, the hole in this plan is that you, I sign up for your service, you discover that I'm paying AT&T $120 a month, and you're like, actually, you can do better. We're going to call on your behalf, renegotiate your contract, getting down to 70. But do you send me a bill? Like, like how do you pay me and for how long? If this is a monthly bill that you reduce by 30%, like how long do you keep charging me that 40% that you say? Or is it a one-off? Is it per year? There's some things about this business model that don't fully, that either aren't fully thought through, but I don't think that's the case. I think it's just not on the slides in a way that really connects all the dots. Our North Star metric, saving per non-active user. The average annual savings generated from our non-active users after initial signup. Okay, so this is interesting. So what the company is optimizing for is once a customer has signed up and then just leaves it running in the background, how much can they save for those customers? That's really cool. I think that's a really interesting way of looking at this type of business. And customers who sign up once and then just automatically save money, I totally get why that's a powerful and valuable use case to customers. So that's really cool. Can we save for qualifying bills? Success rate is over 95%. Okay. Can we save repeatedly? Yeah. Can we automate it? Yeah. Okay, so it seems like this company has been running this as a concierge MVP, doing it like customer by customer, one by one, and then prove that what they're trying to do works. And then there's an automation layer that's starting to happen as the company grows. That's a really good way of building this type of company. And that's really encouraging. Now, I hope that the very next slide shows numbers, right? Shows how much savings, how many customers and all that kind of stuff to really get a sense of what the scale is of where the company is today. Focus on build negotiation, build AI empire, scale execution levers. Okay, so this is the strategic outline of where the company is and is going. And I would really like to see this as numbers. Like, how many bills have you negotiated? How much money have you saved? How many customers do you have signed up? All those types of things. This is good, but I want to know this as numbers, basically. Okay, the team. Okay, AI and innovation, repeat founders... Okay, this slide is upsettingly bad because it's giving me three names of people and saying what their job titles are within the business or the job roles within the business. One of them is doing AI innovation, the other is doing language models, another one is doing automation and processes. That's great, but what are the job titles? Who's the CEO? Who's the CTO? Who's the CMO? I'm guessing it's along those lines. That helps contextualize what these com companies are. Repeat founders, sure, but I really want to know, wait, on the right here it says founders underneath Mark and Michael, and then on the left it says founding executive team. So does that mean that we have one set of founders that founded the company but aren't involved anymore, and now there's an executive team that is actually running it? I don't know, but this is to me dark maroon flag, right? Because if the founders were involved and they own a bunch of the equity but they're not doing anything anymore, that might be a challenge. So I want to know how involved are these founders? What are they doing? And I think the actual, the words here are pretty vague too. Repeat founders of successful large ventures. Sure, but how successful, how large, how many times, in which countries it, are the companies that they did previously relevant to the companies they're doing now? Like having founder experience is very helpful, Right. But they're saying they're repeat founders of successful large ventures. And to me, make not knowing how to break down a Tam Sam Som, if you're an experienced founder, tells me the opposite. It says, oh, you haven't fully grasped how to tell a market sizing. And so without that, I'm like, okay, now I don't really know what to do with this slide deck. Are they experienced? Are they not? They say they are. How how experienced are they, right? They say they're a repeat founders of successful large, large ventures. Now I'm going to have to go, and there are no links here to their LinkedIn's. But now I'm going to have to go and search for them, find them, see what these businesses are, look them up in pitch book, figure out how successful the exits are and all that kind of stuff. The truth in good storytelling is often show, don't tell, right? Show me what you've done. You don't Telling me that you're a successful founder, great, but show me with numbers. Like how much money did you return to investors? What was the exits like? What spaces were you in? That kind of thing. This team slide is, is pretty underwhelming. Okay. Our advantage AI strategy and implementation. We understand AI and where AI voice is going. Yes, and I don't think 
that is unique because right now that exists on pretty much every slide deck I'm seeing. Process design and opportunity database. We set up processes and pipelines to build a comprehensive database of opportunities that IP will grow over time. Okay, track record. We have a strong track record of building companies from the ground up. Okay, all three of these you could drop into almost every startup I have ever spoken to. We have an AI strategy. We figured out the processes. We have a strong track record of building companies. I don't know if your if your reference point for successful company is the same as my reference point for successful company. If it is, and you've delivered a multi-billion dollar exit to a VC in the past, great. But if you say you've been successful and what you actually did was to create a moderately good business that didn't exit and didn't return money to VCs, then we're talking a different language here. And so I think this slide is actually a little bit challenging because it, it, it says your advantage, but there's nothing about this that is actually unique. There's nothing here that shouts, okay, Windfalls is going to win this battle when the going gets tough. So this may very well be your advantage, but I want to see the receipts. Like AI strategy implementation, why, what do you have that's unique, hard to repeat? How, does, how do these three things become part of your moat? How does this make your company more defendable? That's what I really want to know. And this slide deck doesn't say that so far, which is uh, a bit of a challenge. Okay, schedule a call with the team, join the Windfalls community, drop us an email. Okay, so what I would have loved to see here is the name of the person I'm actually talking to. If you're not scheduling a call with the team, you're talking to the CEO who is raising money, right? And the other thing here, did we talk about how much money we're raising? I don't think we did. Advantage, team, where we're heading, hypothesis, bus model, pushing the market. Okay, so I don't know how much money this company is raising, nor what they're going to do with the money. And so I don't really have any frame of reference here. It doesn't say anything about how many customers it has. It doesn't say anything about how many, what revenue it's doing, the status of the product, etc. And I think that's fluffy. Like this is not a bad pitch deck. It has a lot of the important talking points, curiosities and all that kind of stuff. But what it's truly and loudly missing is how much money you're raising, what are you going to do with the money, how far are you in so far, and customer acquisition cost and actual numbers, like how much of this is built, how far into this are you. This exact deck without that information could be a $20 million Series A deck. It'd be a very bad one because you haven't shown your traction, but it could be. Or it could be a, hey, we're raising the first $200,000 because we have an idea. We've built in concierge MVP. We think we have something here. We don't really know yet. Give us some money so we can keep experimenting. Okay, so that's been a lot of babbling for me and we're running a little bit late, but I'll take a look at the chat and see if anybody has any questions. And from there, yeah, let's see what we've got. All right, everybody, thank you for coming along to another Pitch Deck review. Uh, I hope this was helpful to you. As I mentioned, if you want your own Pitch Deck review, get a subscription to Pitch Guide and submit it to me. And every month I'm back with another Pitch Deck review so we can learn from each other. Uh, I hope this was super helpful. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Pitch Guide chat. See you all very soon.